and taxes, undermining all the progress that we have made on the economy. And it is only the Conservatives that will give people the opportunity to build wealthier, more secure lives for them and their families. Yeah. Leave the opposition, Keir Starmer. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Like the Prime Minister, I know the whole House will welcome the agreement reached overnight. We repeat our calls for Hamas to release all hostages immediately. This humanitarian pause must be used to get the hostages out safely, to tackle the urgent and unacceptable humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza, and to make progress to a full cessation of hostilities. Mr Speaker, in recent years, the international community has treated the two-state solution as a slogan rather than a serious strategy, and that must now change. Like the Prime Minister, I also I am sure I speak for everyone in the House in saying our hearts go out to the families and friends of the four young men from Shrewsbury who tragically lost their lives this week. It is a living nightmare for any parent, and I can hardly begin to imagine their loss. Mr. Speak, Mr. Speaker, this week the Prime Minister unveiled the latest version of his five pledges for the country. Let us hope he has more success with these than the last ones. Did he forget the NHS? Prime Minister. Well, Mr. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, not only when I became Prime Minister, just weeks after becoming Prime Minister, we injected record funding into the NHS and in social care. We also unveiled the first ever long-term workforce plan in the NHS's 75-year history. But I'm pleased he mentioned the five pledges because, as he knows, three of them are economic. And on a day which we will focus on the economy, I'm pleased to report that we have indeed halved inflation. No thanks to the party opposite. We have indeed grown the economy and we have indeed reduced debt. That's a Conservative government delivering for this country. Well, the reason he ignored the NHS, not only in his new pledges, but just now, is because 7.8 million people are currently on the waiting lists. That's half a million more than when he pledged to bring them down nearly a year ago. The Prime Minister just claimed that this is all about economic growth. So let me ask him, if a labourer or a care worker is forced to wait a year for an operation, how are they meant to help grow the economy? Mr Speaker, we are doing an enormous amount to bring waiting lists down. We're enormous amount. Expanding patient choice, rolling out new community diagnostic centres, new surgical hubs, as well as putting more doctors and nurses in our ward. But I guess the question, Mr Speaker, is when he talks about targets and waiting lists, I really just hope that the Welsh Labour Government aren't listening. After, 20, after 25 years in power, they're missing every single one of his targets. Weren't they meant to be his blueprint? Mr Speaker, more than double the entire population of Wales are currently on a waiting list in England. He really needs to take some responsibility. And on his watch, 2.5 million people are too sick to work with the majority also suffering from mental health issues. On top of his failures on waiting lists, can he tell us how many people are waiting for mental health treatment? Well, actually, mi- mi- Mr Speaker, we've injected record sums to expand the number of mental health treatments in our country. But, Mr Speaker, I, I talked about the practical things that we are doing with CDCs and surgical hubs. But he doesn't also seem to realise that the union action that he fails to condemn and that his members of parliament support from the picket lines have led to several hundred thousand cancelled appointments, all making waiting lists worse. And he asked about Wales, but we can look at it. In Wales, over 70,000 people are waiting over 18 months for treatment, compared to in England, where, thanks to our efforts, we have virtually eliminated 18 months' wait. And that's the difference between us, Mr Speaker. He wants to play politics. We get things done. So raising the waiting list by half a million is getting things done. He's through the looking glass, this one. I asked the Prime Minister how many people are waiting for mental health treatment. He knows the answer, he just doesn't want to give it. 1.2 million. 200,000 are children, some waiting nearly two years to be seen. 
Would the Prime Minister accept those kind of delays if it were one of his family or friends? Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, one of the key things we are doing to bring down waiting lists is to expand the access of patient choice. It's a very straightforward idea to make sure that patients can choose where they get treated, and that way we will bring down waiting lists for mental health and other treatments far faster. Now, the Labour Party's policy on this is a total and utter mess. First, he promised, in his words, to ban NHS use of the independent sector. Then he said he wants more use of the independent sector. His shadow health secretary agreed with that, but then the deputy leader said that she would end it. As ever, you simply don't know what they stand for, and you can't trust a word they say. As ever, no responsibility for the shocking state of the NHS. The truth is the Prime Minister would not accept those weights for his family, and neither should anyone else. This morning I spoke to an NHS nurse. For many months, for many months, Cam struggled to find time to, to see her 14-year-old son, Mikey, until he became seriously unwell. And now he hasn't been able to be in mainstream education for over a year. Mikey's mum is having to balance nursing with caring and being a parent. And this isn't a one-off. There are families up and down the country in exactly the same situation, working hard, trying to get through the cost of living crisis, whilst desperately worried about relatives who can't get the treatment they need. How does he think they feel when they see the Prime Minister refusing to take responsibility and boasting that everything is fine? Mr Speaker, we are doing absolutely everything we can to put money into the NHS to bring down the waiting list, because I do want families up and down the country to have access to the health care that they need. He's absolutely right. They do deserve it. But then it is incredibly galling, Mr Speaker, to hear this from someone who, when there are strikes happening in our hospitals and people are being denied access to emergency medical care, not only only does he not have the strength to condemn it, He refuses to back legislation that would guarantee all the families that he talked about that access. This is on his watch. It's his responsibility. Thirteen thirteen years in, and all he's got to offer is trying to blame the opposition for his failures. Over and over again. Mikey's mum, Mikey's mum. I'll tell you what Mikey's mum said to me this morning, shall I, if you're so interested to hear. She said, she said, and I'm going to quote her, she said, whatever spin the government puts on it, you can't hide the reality for ordinary working people. That's her words. Worth reflecting on. Now, I'm glad that in recent years, real progress has been made in tackling the stigma surrounding mental health. But the fact remains that the suicide rate for 15 to 19-year-olds has doubled since 2010, and suicide is now the biggest killer of men under 45. And they're not just statistics. Every single one is a tragic loss to families and to friends. Politics has the ability to turn this around. It means tough choices. If we were to scrap tax loopholes, We could have thousands more staff, more support in our schools, more support in our communities. That would allow us to treat patients on time, getting them back to work, back to their families, and, crucially, giving them their lives back. This is about mental health. That's Labour's plan. Will he back it? Well, Mr Speaker, it was this government that, for the first time in the NHS's history, ensured that it had a long-term workforce plan, providing it with record funding so that we can eliminate long waits, but also ensuring that it has the money that it needs to train record numbers of doctors and nurses, whilst radically reforming how they work to improve productivity, because the only way we will get everyone the treatment that they need is to make sure that the NHS has a fantastic staff that it needs, and it's this government that has put that in place. And we can look, because he talks about records, Mr Speaker, because this is something that no government has done in the past. It's something I'm proud we've done. Labour's record on this issue is clear. It was a disastrous failure of workforce planning. And those weren't my words, Mr Speaker. Those were the verdict of the Labour-chaired 
Health Select Committee. Ah. It was Labour that did not train the consultants that we would need now, that take 13, 14, 15 or years to train. And it's this government that is for the first time making sure that every family will finally have the doctors and nurses that they need. <laughs>